It says we have 11 attendees. I don't see them. Anymore. Okay. Welcome, everyone. Um, I'm so happy to see you have joined us tonight for our Meet the Artist conversation. I'm Dr. Hinderleiter, I'm director of the Duke Hall Gallery of Fine Art. And tonight we're having uh, an online conversation with Mallory Burrell and Danielle Romano who have exhibits up in the Duke Hall Gallery currently. Um, these were shows that were originally planned for last spring, but due to the virus, we've held them over um, for the start of our fall semester. And I know that things are um, undergoing changes now as JMU is transitioning to uh, online learning for a month. So I'm glad that um, you're here to meet the artists in our virtual scenario. Um, I'm going to uh, share a little bit with you for those that haven't seen the exhibit yet, um, particularly those who are um, uh, for those of you who haven't seen the show yet. Uh, who are taking online um, classes from the start of the semester. Um, this, what you're looking at now is uh, Daniel Romano's show, which is called Recanonizing the Tool Constructions and Insincerity in Digital Age. And Daniel will explain a little bit more about her title and about the show in, in a minute, but I'm just going to walk you through um, her exhibit. So we see some photographs um, on the wall here, um, and this is a, a wider view of the front part of the gallery, where she has several different works that you can see here, including um, two different sculptures that have um, video and projected components in them as well. Uh, another angle where we can see one work um, that involves um, a component of a, a pedicure and a video of Danielle performing the use of the pedicure machine that was filmed on site very close to here in Harrisonburg. And she can tell us a little bit more about this. Um, Here's another one of her sculptures and the video components that goes along with it. That is um, a makeup applicator. It's called Depot um, 10 Color Tool. I'm correct about the title. No, no. Okay, okay. Um, so I'm just walking you again through. Um, the rest of Daniel's exhibits. Here's one more of her photographs showing her uh, making use of one of her sculptures. Okay, um, and then let's just walk you through Mallory uh, Burrell's exhibit, Unearthing Strata and Changing Waters. So what we see um, on the wall, the back wall of the gallery um, here is uh, Black's Run on the, Right-hand side of the photograph, these are trash bags, snack bags, balloons, different kinds of items that she found in Black's Run Creek, which as you know, is the stream that runs through Harrisonburg um, and is quite uh, polluted. And towards the left side of the photograph, we see Polyrhizotomatic nematoda specimens. This is also found trash from Black's Run Creek as well. Um, a wider angle view on the right, we see her um, installation, the stream and the scrap collector, which is a digital collage on fabric on piled in front of it is also um, trash and objects and, and scrap that she has found from um, local waterways like Black Runs Creek. Um, close up, what is really kind of fascinating is, is for those of you who haven't been able to see the exhibit so far is all the texture and the detail and the dirt and the different stages of decay um, 
that is present in the different um, trash bags and items that she's attached to the wall. There's also a video. Um, this is a still of the video of polyrhizotomatic nematoda, which is quite eerie. We see underwater footage of plastic bags billowing um, and the soundtrack also quite eerie uh, with uh, kind of unearthly sounds uh, that fill the gallery. This is a, a companion piece for the video, uh, which we just showed earlier. Um, some of her drawing series that is uh, the 99 cent specimen. I'm, gonna, I'm forgetting the exact title. Forgive me. Um, so there, that um, going. Okay, now that we switched from stopping sharing, let me turn the video, the sound back on. Uh, so we're going to move into a conversation. And uh, at first, I'm going to ask some questions, um, switching back and forth between Mallory Burrell and, and Daniel Romano. And at the end, uh, I invite you all to pose questions. If you type them into either the, the Q&A or the chat, we'll be able to read them and answer them. Um, and thanks so much for, for being with us. So, um, Mallory, in, in your work, we see uh, the remnants of your trip foraging for trash, uh, cleaning the landscapes, as well as documenting um, the local streams and waterways like Black Run Creek. Um, how has your time spent in our local landscapes changed your artistic practice? Thank you, Beth. Uh, I've found that in my time um, the last three years in Harrisonburg, being in the local landscape, um, specifically Black Run Stream, um, it's influenced my artwork tremendously. I, I started out seeing as seeing trash as a means of cleaning up a place or making it look the way I saw that it should look, you know, a nice pristine landscape. And then my artistic shift practice shifted when I realized that the stuff that I was excavating, excavating was just as interesting and even more um, important for me to study and to make work from than even the landscape that I was Ex excavating from. And so in the process, I've learned to um, manipulate some of the images that I'm finding off these advertised trash bags and through my camera, I've found uses for them in installation and I've manipulated them through video. So overall, I found that uh, what originally took me out into the land, um, which was to make it a cleaner place has really um, acted in this duality now that I'm cleaning and then not only that now these materials I'm taking from the landscape are now raw materials um, which is definitely newer these past few years to my artistic practice than was previously great um let me just follow up on that you know we can see behind you a lot of the um remnants and the trash and the scraps that you both put on the floor and you now to the wall uh, and it, it, time is such a, a large component of your work because, you know, we see the, um, the trash has decayed and it's gotten dirty. And we even had a conversation where we talked about how much dirt might remain on the gallery floor right, as, as you were finishing up your installation. So what do you think about the role of time in your work? Um, has your relationship to trash changed over time? Definitely. Um, time, uh, like, like a stream, it is, it, it flows ever more. But when I find these uh, artifacts in the water, they have a, a way of slowing um, time down for a bit. You get to actually look at the look at the bag, look at the thing that you might not have studied so much if you saw it in the store and we're just going to grab it. 
And, and even delving further into actual literal time on the stream, there's been moments where I've timed myself. So I've given myself a 30 minute, you know, on my clock, how much trash can I, can I collect? And even then it's, it's kind of astounding how much um, I can collect in even a short amount of time. So again, a lot of my work plays on these different, these dualities, right? It's the time that the objects in the water in the landscape that it takes to degrade and come with this new surface. And then there's the time that it takes for me to clean it out and whether or not I get it bunch one day or not is, is not as important as it is just recognizing that in even just a few days time, continuing going in further and more time that more trash will have taken its place. So, uh, I'm starting to realize more and more that trash, um, is a speaks to a moment in time. But also it speaks to almost like a self portrait of a place and you can really see, um. Kind of what the culture of a place is by looking at the trash at a specific time that's been found. So that's a great question. Time is a huge, huge, um. Uh, it manipulates my work a lot in multiple uh, variations. Great, thank you. Um, Danielle. Let's um, think a little bit about the themes in, in your work, and you can tell us about um, your approach to your exhibit. Um, you know, Mallory's work has a theme of um, environment and ecology, but your work um, in the gallery is focused on gender and gender stereotypes, particularly those associated with the worlds of construction and hardware stores and uh, but also beauty and cosmetics. And usually those are two spheres that are really kind of held far apart, right? <laughs> the hardware store or the beauty salon. Um, but they come together in your installation. Can you tell us a little bit about what inspired your work? Yeah. Um, so uh, the road to this body of work was not really a necessarily easy one. Um, I think I've been working whether or not I knew it, um, this body of work for a long time, but not, I think as successfully as it's seen here. Um, Cause in, in some previous works I was playing with um, gender, I also still think a lot about my role, role as um, the person that's acting with these objects, but also being enacted upon by the objects. Um, that was in some work that I'd been thinking about for undergrad and I still see it bubbling up um, in this work, um, but yeah, it wasn't, I think I thought about these themes for a long time, but they didn't necessarily come out this way, but my, um, my entry points were kind of this gendered construction makeup, uh, amalgamations, um, came from, like, I think about it from my parents perspective, I guess. Um, so I would spend, you know, my formative years, like doing hair and makeup with my mom and like as my dad and uh, like brother were fixing things in the garage, I'd be like the gopher. So they'd say, go, go for this, go get that. So I'd, I have to know like my relationship to the, I was always like the middleman between a series of two other people, but I still had to know what the tool did to make it do the thing that it was supposed to do. Um, and so I, I think about kind of the role of the tool and my relationship with that. Um, but I also like to complicate things because the the tools are not acting in the way that you would normally expect them to. They're applying makeup, um, and through kind of just starting this work and like playing around with it, I found a lot of like really funny similarities or like punny, I guess you could say, between um, construction. So like the foundation for your face is like the foundation for a house, which is like that formative layer you want to put on. Um, and I like to play those up because there is a lot of um, like in the in the spheres of like YouTube makeup application and DIY like makeup, um, they have a bunch of like codified language. So for example, the um, the title the Depot X Color Pop tool, um, it's not it's not pronounced like ten, it's X because in the makeup world, if you like collaborate with someone with collab, um, the X would stand for by or with instead of ten. Um, so I was playing up on that, like codified language. That's always like, I was like sneaking it into their. Like, really sly, um, 
their tutorials. So I try and accentuate that. But yeah. Um, for for the attendees who haven't been to the gallery to see some of the work yet, can you maybe tell us a little bit about one of your specific sculptures? Like, um, yeah. Um, the image. Do you have the images handy? Can we pull them up again by chance? Yes. Uh, cool. Maybe let's start with the Anastasia one because that was the first in the series. Uh, is this the one Spindly Crane Arm one? Yeah. Uh, one more down. This one. Um, one, one more down. Okay. This one. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> um. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, well, there we go. Cool. Yes. This is the, um, Anastasia, um, the Anastasia makeup tool when I was playing off of a particular brand. Um, she has the Anastasia, the brow whiz, if anyone is like deep into the makeup uh, canon, I guess you could say. Um, so I called it the Anastasia multi-tool because um, in the video you can see me like contorting around here to uh, apply my makeup with it because um, an important part of work is the video documentation or photos that come from it. I think it's 50-50 for me, like I can't have the one without the other. Um, but the spindly piece you see on the wall um, is actually has a foot or not a foot, a wheel on the bottom. Um, so installing it, um, it needs like a little arm braced on the wall, but it features like a makeup sponge, um, a paint roller to apply your um, foundation. Um, and there's some other additional um, tools on there, but it also comes with uh, a paint tray like you would put paint on the wall with. Um, and that piece I actually worked on with a visiting artist, Rebecca Forsater, um, and the performance was filmed live, so did it in one go. Um, but it really encouraged me to like think about kind of because it was super awkward and clumsy to like, hold on your own, so we mounted it to their Art on Wheels trailer that, that they brought, um, and I had to kind of contort myself to the tool, um, and that became a real big part of the work. Um, as I like to complicate the tools that I'm um, featuring, I kind of also work to complicate the entirety of the process and the tool I'm working with. So there's a lot of contortion happening, uh, a lot of physical acrobatics I kind of have to do to like pull off um, the ease with which I'm selling the tool too. Cause I'm like, wow, look how, look how easy it is to use, look how functional. And yet I'm here like contorting the body just to use it. Um, because I like to, I think another big part of the online like makeup tutorials is um, like the fakeness, and that's kind of where the insincerity um, in the digital realm digital came from. Because um, I don't, I don't know, maybe I'm a skeptic, but I can see through, I can see through their thinly veiled like salesman tactics, um, and I kind of emulate that in my performance as well. But yeah. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay. Okay. Um, so, Mallory, let's go back to your installation. Um, your 99 cent fauna series of drawings includes hybrid animals, which are also made up of trash, such as a beaver and a cookie wrapper uh, or bear and a package of gummy candies, gummy bears. Um, how did you come to create that group of work? Um, sure. Like Danielle, would you mind if we went to a slide actually of one of those two pairings? That'd be great. Yes. Do you want this one or this one? Um, the the first one is great. Thank you. Yep. 
Ah, that's all forward then. Sorry. I know you wanted the first one. Great. Yes. Okay. Um, so like you said, a lot of my work has to do with hybridization and this, uh, you know, love of, you know, the all organic and the, the acceptance that uh, the artificial is everywhere and it's infiltrated every, every layer of our ecology. And this series is called the 99 cent fauna series is uh, their composites of printed advertisement and black and white graphite drawings. They came about because I was um, in the stream as I as I was many days and there would be times when I would get frustrated because I, I would see a lot more wildlife in the packages that I was picking up than I was finding in the actual streamway. Um, not to say that there wasn't some wildlife there, it just wasn't as, as much. And uh, one day I saw this Patagonia fish sticker in the stream and it was just laying there on this uh, rock and it was very, you know, had the water flowing over it and there were actual fish around and the irony of it just struck me because it was, um, it was just so funny to me that this sticker would end up here and I, I really made that connection where it was just, wow, okay, what happens one day if we come to find that there are more animals on our printed packaging than there are um, actually out there for us to discover um, that live live in the wild. And so these drawings uh, harken back, well, to me, it's, you know, this, both these things, my drawing and the excavated uh, artifact, in these cases, lots of them are packages. Um, they both are excavated from my hand or they're being put into the paper by my hand. And so they're, they're personal in that aspect um, but in many ways, they harken back to me the old relief um, wood etchings of, you know, historical um, natural history, fauna and flora, and how lots of them were popularized in the Enlightenment period and when cabinets of curiosities were at their peak, people were um, grabbing these prints as much as they could or originals if they could afford it uh, of animals and plants that they maybe have never seen before from obviously other places that were um, more likely um, being exploited for their natural resources. But uh, so that's what these pieces are relating to as well. Just this history of the natural history image and this new format that our, um, our wildlife is now being uh, almost sold to us, which is in, again, as we see here in the camel and the beaver, um, a cigarette ad and then also a cookie ad. And to further accentuate this idea of hybridization or the two kind of blending and molding into one another are their names. So they're all given scientific names that are many times allude to both the real animal and the object that it comes from. Um, so for the woodchuck, um, it, the scientific name is the uh, castra cacao. Um, so it has to deal with the coca, so chocolate, and then also for the um, Latin name for the woodchuck. And in parentheses, it's called the chocolate chip beaver. Uh, then to kind of bring, bring it back to, okay, how did this actual object, how did it exist in life before I took it out of the land? Um, so the, that series is a is a prime example of how um, my ideas about hybridization come together. Um, yeah, uh -huh. yes. that explains a lot. I, I I think I did think it was a beaver. So uh, <laughs> um, that that helps me understand the work quite a bit more. Um, I was. Uh, I'm reading something the other day about uh, an environmental scientist, and he was talking about how we always hear and focus on extinctions, but we should also think about what he called the great thinning of an uh, animal population. And so I'm really glad that your work is, is bringing attention to our many creatures uh, in the natural world. Uh, and that history of our uh, scientific um, and artistic um, you know, illustrations of them. Uh, did you want to maybe say anything about these other two? Um, I'm sure I can say something about those two um, because they are a little bit 
on there later on, they weren't some of the first drawings. So um, it, it might be a little bit more difficult to see, but um, if you've noticed uh, on the images on the left, it's the star kiss tuna character, uh, Charlie. And at the bottom, it's being brought into an actual rendering of um, an albacore tuna. And both of these images, um, I'll, go, I'll stay on the finished image. Um, so at the bottom, you see what the, um, the net weight was on the actual package. And um, there's a detail in that text where you can kind of see that something's been laid over top of the image. So that part um, is a bit more damaged than the other parts. So that and the other piece, the, the Harizali bear, um, it's a grizzly bear that's turning into the Haribo gummy bear. Um, he has the text that is actually on the package um, right next to him. So I'm starting to bring in more of the language from the actual advertisements into the images of the um, characters because in in many ways it for me solidifies the um, kind of like the falseness that they they advertise. And so all of the extra lettering, any of the other things I've gleaned from the um, package, I, I draw rather than scan in from the actual computer just to give it that attention and, you know, to say, hey, um, this is part of the actual package. But when it's doled out, it's done in pencil, it's monotone, uh, the effect isn't quite as um, powerful. So the in the Harizli bear image, it says the I think it says the original since 1922. Uh, and again, when it's kind of in that dead end mono, monochromatic state um, next to this, you know, highly furry uh, grizzly bear that has this bright orange head um, all together, the package becomes something. And there's actually a gummy bear package that I have um, drawn kind of at the bear's feet and it's been you can tell it's trash and there's nothing left in it um so rendering the actual trash as well so um speaking about hearkening back to natural history um etchings and drawings bringing in actual language from the package in that style um along with the animal i think it um again it with the duality in my work it brings back this Okay, now this is actual today, um, today blending in with ideas of the past. Um, so those are the other two. Um, I don't know if I see an image of any of the other drawings. So those are the four that are in the show. Thank you. All right. Um, Danny, I'm going to uh, maybe put up one of the um, larger slides from your show and maybe um, ask you the last question before we open it to audience questions. Um, so uh, attendees, if you are thinking about your questions and you want to write them in the chat, now might be a good time. Um, Danielle, especially uh, for the um, undergraduate students who might be listening to our conversation here, uh, who might be thinking about going off to graduate school um, in the future, can you explain a little bit about the process of developing a show such as yours that we see here and what goes into to realizing it? Yeah. Um, so this work has been, probably off and on in the making for about a year um, between the videos uh, you see and then the actual pieces. Um, I actually paused this body of work while I had a weird semester of um, working on crop circles. Um, still kind of thinking about the same thing, um, but not executing it in a way that felt great. So um, I put the crop circles down and came back to this. Um, but yeah, the the process is fairly involved. I mean, um, but I enjoy it. Like, I don't necessarily like being like the star of the show when I'm myself. But like, when I'm a character, it feels kind of easy to pick up. So when I was like doing the crop circles, I felt really weird because I was me. Um, but when I have that like um, 
and this goes back to the work I was working on in undergrad, um, thinking about my role behind the or in front of the camera. Um, it feels easier when when it's a character, but um, yeah, this, the body of work has been in process for a while. Um, but I've also been able I had the great pleasure of filming at um, Randy's Hardware out in Stanton. Um, so the video that you see directly on that um, back wall, I was filming my pedicure multi-tool. Um, they so graciously let me in their space because that's kind of another fun element to um, performing. Um, people don't always like you doing weird art stuff in their spaces um, without a little bit of an explainer. Um, you give them your elevator pitch, your short one sentence, this is what I do, and cross your fingers that they're supportive of the arts. Um, luckily, um, Randy's was, so they let me film there. Um, that's the piece you directly behind you. So I film the process of, um, from the first step of a pedicure, soaking your feet, to um, the final step is putting on nail polish. So I filmed that um, at Randy's, so shameless plug for them. Um, they let me, let me film there. Um, what kind of responses but, did you get from people walking down there? <laughs> it was fun. Um, I had some people, I didn't prime them at all. I had some advice, people like, oh, maybe you should put a sign on the door like live filming. And I was like, oh, I, I don't wanna stop the business. I'll, like I usually get weird looks anyway, so I'm going to roll with it, but people, you know, like, oh my, what's going on? Um, it's kind of funny seeing them reacting like in the edges of the frames. Um, so I think I kept them in if they happen to be in a clip that I needed. Um, but yeah, it's some interesting reaction. So that's always a, a part that I might not ever get over my stage fright for. Finding a location, you know, planning that out. Um, but she, like, it's important to you, so you got to make it work in whatever way you can. And one caveat of the time we're in now um, with COVID, um, I forced myself to learn how to green screen, which is not as hard as you would expect. Um, so I, the background of the last piece that's hanging from the chains in the gallery, um, I green screened myself into a ikea style bathroom um so i was thinking similarly about the setting of the piece yeah perfect thank you um being important because the big projection on the gallery wall i was going for um like a bath fitter like home expo feel um because i wouldn't have randy's physical gallery in like uh in the gallery so um that is still location, be it in the gallery or behind the piece in the gallery is still important to me. Um, but yeah, as far as um, wanting to work on stuff in grad school, I say do it. It's, you'll never have that time in your life to focus on art the way you can in grad school. So if you're looking at it, I say go for it. Especially now you might have more free time if you have an online program. Great. Um, well, thank you so much. Thanks to both of you. I'm going to um, thank you. <laughs> um, Hey, Tyler asks us, um, as both of your works overlap with other fields such as environmental studies and performative arts, how much of your works included collaborations with people outside of SADA? That's the School of Art Design and Art History. I can answer that. Um, I found that, uh, I mean, I didn't go to grad school during COVID so much so. I mean, at the very end I did, but um, I found that for me, especially the last couple of years, I was able to get into the biology labs and use their microscopes a lot. So I got microscopic videos and photographs of a lot of the specimen that I was taking out of the stream. And I was also allowed to um, check out specimen from the animal specimen room when I wanted to draw an animal, then I wanted a real actual thing to draw from. Um, so me personally, oh, and in the um, the music department, I've had um, 
one music festival in particular be like really awesome and come to a lot of my shows and stuff. And um, when I was doing a curat curatorial thing at Artworks, I ended up being able to get a musician in the show as well. So I personally have found that I've been able to collaborate with other schools outside of Sada a lot um, in my own practice. People seem to be um, more than willing to get on board with an art project. So I think for a lot of other fields, the visual arts are um, something they don't get asked about to help out with every day. So personally, I found, yeah, a lot. I've had a lot of good experience with that. Great. Tyler follows up and he says, um, uh, was there any experience that you had in these collaborations? Or, and do you think there should be more communication and interaction between the schools of JMU? Um, I think that, I mean, personally, I think it was because I was, I was interested in it. Um, so I think if you are a student, you have the power to ask anybody, anybody for help. Um, if you have a good plan in mind, you have a good, good, you know, um, a good, I guess, background of following through on things. Like, I, I don't know if it should be between the schools so much as in between us as individuals connecting and making our own connections. Um, but I mean, if, if schools were more open about it, um, obviously more people would know that that's an option. But um, I was told by one of my professors, like, you should you should reach out to someone in the biology department. And, and it took just someone mentioning it and saying, oh, OK, yeah, I totally should for me to realize that this whole. Um, whole other world uh, on our campus can open up and, and then in the matter of sending one email. So whether or not it's up to the schools, I don't know. Um, but as individual students, we have we have some power to, to to make those emails ourselves and try and make those moments happen for ourselves as much as we can while we're at a school this big with all these professionals and experts in their field. Why not? Why not send the email? Thank you. Um, Jason asks for both artists. How much of your previous work revolved around similar themes shown in these bodies of work? Danielle, you want to jump in there? Sure. Maybe um, if I had to put it in a percentage, I'd say maybe forty percent. But I think I think I was executing the same things I'm thinking about now, and maybe different processes or materials. But I think they stuck with me. Um, and I think once you find your groove of, of things that you know how to work with or like challenging yourself with. Um, you're able to distill better and faster what it is you're thinking about and putting into your art. So nothing's permanent. Art can be sold, it can go away, it can go in the dumpster, you can always remake it. Um, it's the ideas that stick for me. So thank you. Yeah. Um, Kathy Schwartz asks for both of you, how have your JMU MFA experiences contributed to the conceptual development in your work? Is there anyone who inspired you along the way? Yes, <laughs> of course. Um, as a graduate student, you have the um, ability to ask people to be on your committee and they can say yes or no. But obviously, the people that I asked to be on my committee were direct influences um, on my work at, at JMU. And um, I had an advisor who was incredible, Lisa Tubach, who was also interested in similar things that I am. So it was great to have her as a um, an advisor to, to hash things out with, to go through papers and, and everything. And also for me personally, the studio was right next to um, the stream. So Jamie, you very much influenced that as well, just, just by sheer locality of being able to walk outside of my studio and see it right there. Um, so yeah, that, so JMU and Sada has definitely influenced um, my work um, and in great ways, and in great ways we've been challenged as well, asked really great questions. Um, yeah. Oh, Thanks. Do you want to add anything, Danielle? Yeah, yeah, I'll go ahead. Um, yeah, I would, I would say ditto, but I have a longer answer to that. Um, yeah, I actually sought out the people um, I wanted to work with before I even got to grad school. That was kind of my 
uh, a little trick to like starting in DC and working out where for schools I was applying to. So I already had been like following Rob and Greg and all the other folks that I got to work with. Um, so it was already hooked whether they wanted me or not. But um, yeah, I was so fortunate to have worked with um, great faculty who were so giving up their time um, and materials and spaces. Um, and I think being in the community of artists that make work um, continually or like you get to be in their space working when they're working. Um, I love that. I, I eat that up. Um, and so I was happy to have been in the JMU community of artists. So oh, we're so glad um, that the show gets to uh, highlight all of your experiences at, at JMU. Uh, Sydney asks for Mallory, since your relationship with trash has changed, as you said in the discussion, do you plan to implement more sustainable art practices in the future? Yes. Um, I think that's, that's the plight of anybody that's working in, in, in something called the environmental arts, um, which is, I, I don't know if that term is even the best for me. Um, but yeah, I think that as I continue to grow, there's obviously some, um, there's this tension that exists at all times when I'm making, because as someone who pulls out tons of trash from the stream, um, I then have to consider the materials that I'm using um, when I'm making new things out of it. So printing a, um, a mural of the different things that I've collected, um, is that the most sustainable um, as far as materials? Uh, that can be debated for hours and hours. Um, but yeah, I definitely think that my relationship will continue to change with trash. Um, and my previous statement was really more just instead of it being, for me, my relationship changed because it became something that instead of I was just redisposing away and I was just taking it out and then not really giving it any thought afterward, it would just go into you know, the dumpster after I cleaned it out of the stream. Um, and so the relationship changed when I decided to keep it and I put it in my studio. Um, and in just in the sheer act of doing that, I brought in lots of smells into my studio, lots of um, wolf spiders. Now that I'm graduated, I can say that. Um, so lots of different things made it made their way into it. And so there's always this for me internal struggle. Um, and I'll speak I'll speak about it externally too about how do how do you make sustainable art um, if if lots of the things that are um, you know available materials aren't necessarily the most sustainable. So I'm still working towards that myself. And I think it will probably be a lifelong um, commitment to, to trying and still keeping my head in the game and still working, um, but also being mindful of that. Thank you. Um, Ryan Miller asks, do you have any advice on getting your work out into the world? Danny, do you want to take that? He said, yeah, I can take it. He said, any any bias? Any advice on oh, how to get your artwork out into the public? Sure. Um, yeah, so because of COVID, things have definitely changed in terms of who will see your work in a physical gallery. Um, but fortunately, we have the internet. Um, and as a recent grad, um, I can say you're not always going to get a response in terms of things that you send out. It might just be radio silence, but you just got to blast the the people that are important or the places you're, that are important that your work is seen. Um, and eventually you will hear back from someone. So that's my short answer right now. Um. Dr. Lark has been asked, um, uh, how have uh, the health and economic crises in which we are living right now affected your work or you're thinking about your work? Um, I can take, I'll take that, I'll pick that. Um, 
it has changed uh, my the way I think about my work um, a lot. I think right when everything started shutting down, I became someone who was like the first person to pick up any piece of trash on the sidewalk or the stream anywhere I found it. And then it really was this like sudden switch where I was just like, oh, well, who had that? Where did that come from? Um, is that going to be, it's, um, should I bring that back home? Oh, wait, my studio's at my house now. Do I want to bring all this stuff back to my house? Um, so I think that for me, um, as far as my process goes, it's the, the pandemic has completely changed um, that. And I'm, I'm working on how to build a practice that um, can, can work nomadically, both like outside and inside my home studio. Um, at the moment, so as far as the way I think about my work goes, um, I'm not. I'm not. I, COVID kind of came right as I was finalizing a lot of my ideas about the work, and a lot of the work was, um, you know, sixty to seventy percent done or developed. So I didn't have a huge influence on the work at the time. Um, it was really after after all the pieces were done and we were in we were in the shutdown that um, my relationship. To picking up trash change for a little bit, and it was a weird thing to not grab something that I saw. Um, so that's how it's changed for me right now, at least. Thank you. Danielle, do you want to jump in there? Yeah, um, so similarly, my process hasn't changed. Um, but I've been kind of wondering how I can keep the awkwardness and cumbersomeness of the pieces. Um, but I'm thinking about many versions of what they are or um, things that could fit in like your pocket. But then, I don't know, I'm still torn between the awkwardness of the pieces, which requires a lot of the bigness to be there. Um, so I'm trying to decide if I want to maximize or go minimalist with my my pieces right now. So I think the one that was on the chains is the smallest in terms of its spread right now because um, it's compactable. But um, gathering material is weird too. It's the beginning of COVID. Um, I was quarantining for a while, so I wasn't able. Um, I was just trying to dream up um, makeup looks with a with the literal tool I had at home, um, screwdrivers, what have you on hand. Um, but fortunately, our state is. Uh, we're in Maryland, so um, I've been able to go to the store when necessary and grab stuff. But yeah, trying to decide. I'm I'm torn between maximizing and minimalizing my practice right now. So yeah. Great. Well, thank you both very much. I think we have come to the end of our audience questions. Um, I want to thank everyone who was able to join us tonight. Um, and again, thanks so much to Danielle and Mallory. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Beth. Thank you all for being here. Bye. Bye.